can see Roel. Yeah, I can see La Fain. La 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 Fain. He's back. Bless your heart. Miss Suzanne is at my right hand. Welcome to everyone. It's that time. One o'clock to three. What's going on? What's going on? It's on the bridge. On the baddest station on the planet. The Bridge 99 FM. To the world. Bridge Nation, you ready? From all over the globe. Yeah? Hallelujah. We bless God for what he's about to do. I'm Pastor Junior Tucker and I'm the host of On the Bridge. What is On the Bridge? On the Bridge is a show where we link up the church and the street and we have a conversation, a reasoning. A deb- not, no, not, not debate. I was about to say no a debate. No debate. No debate. We're not preaching to anybody. We're not trying to, you know, like to push nothing on nobody's throat. It's just a vibe. And we just want to reach out to you. Tell your friends, please. You know, let them know what's going on. Let them know what's going on. Yeah? You're on the bridge with Pastor Junior Tucker. Glad you can join us. Happy Heroes Weekend, everybody. Yeah? We get a little time to spend with the family. Don't look at it as lockdown. Sometimes we look at things and we say, oh, I'm locked. We're down. But look at it the other way. You get to spend time with your children, looking at them face. I make your son tell you the little, you know, things that, you know, to you, my God, what is he talking about? But to him, it's important. Come on, somebody. Hug up your daughter and tell her she's pretty and she's smart and she's a champion and she's victorious. Amen. We're going to have a great show today. You, you need to stay tuned. You need to stay tuned. The bridge is going to be on fire. The bridge is going to be on fire. We're going to go to a break. A praise break. Yeah. Chaka chai chai. Gotti gotti. I believe Jonathan Nelson and I call her blessed by my brethren Papa San. Let's praise the Lord. Come on. Tyrone Thompson. For bona fide, we call him Papa San. He's actually talking about his China Berry. <laughs> her name is Reverend Debbie. Pastor Debbie, yeah? He's talking about his wife. That's his Abigail. I love that song. I love that song. Come on and talk to us today on the bridge. Like I said, the bridge is an invitation to a conversation. Yeah? On the bridge is an invitation to a conversation. So we invite you, if you're in social media, if you're, you know, anywhere in social media, if you're on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, we are at the bridge 99 FM. Where are we now? We're at the bridge 99 FM social media. I am Junior Tucker. If you're on Instagram, you can reach out to me, Facebook, Junior Tucker. Or the hashtag Junior Tucker on the bridge. Yeah, if you need to talk to us uh, via WhatsApp or text, if you want to text us, send us a voice note. 876 551 5782. That's 876 551 5782. Studio line 876 676 4996. What time you my studio line? I mean, you can call us and talk to us. 876-676-4996. If you want to be a part of Bridge Nation, what I mean by Bridge Nation? You are bridging with us and, and, and building the nation at the same time. What is that? That's sponsorship. That's advertising your product, getting a part of us to support and to spread this, you know, this message that we spread every day throughout the week. Yeah? Then you can call us um, in the sales department, 876 876- Six six nine five thousand. That's eight seven six 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 nine five thousand. Somebody will be more than happy to connect with you. This is you know series one episode what fourteen. Yeah, on on the bridge with Pastor Junior Tucker. We are ready to go. Yeah, I, I hope you were in church today. I hope you were in church today. Are you logged on to church? You know, whichever one you do it. We had an awesome time in church. I actually preached the message this morning at Family Word and Worship Church, which is the church that I pastor. I, I get the privilege to pastor alongside my wife, Pastor Trudy. Yeah, and um, you know, we were been in a series called Bounce the Bounce Back, and we talk about um, we, we've been talking about Joseph and how he went from you know being sold by his brothers into slavery, then he went to prison. And then all of a sudden, because of his gift and what God, God favoring him, um, he went straight from the prison to the palace and became the prime minister. Just like that in one, one go, one day, you know, his, his, his um, favor changed. And I wanted to, to, to let people understand that, to, you know, if you're wondering, how, Pastor, how can I, how can I, you know, um, think any kind of optimism like that? Because we're in a pandemic, everything mash up, the job mash up. I mean, that people have, who are even close to me have passed from this pandemic. And, and, and by no means am I trying to say your hit was not legitimate and it was not painful and it was not true. But in the same token, how many of us know God can bounce us back, you know, from, from, um, you know, from where we're coming from? And, and one of the things I want you to know, the first thing I want you to know today, I just want to encourage you, is that when God bounces you back, your bounce back 
can make you, sorry, can make you richer than you were before. What do I mean by that? When God bounces you back from, from, from where you are right now, right now in a pandemic struggling, he doesn't put you back to where you were before. Let me, let me say this to you so that you, you don't miss it. Watch this, watch it. God never repairs anybody. He redeems them. Big difference. What do I mean by that? God never repairs anybody. God will never look at you, see the things that is wrong, see the things that are hurting, and just fix you back to zero. If you were at zero and you got a hit and it made you fall down to minus 55, when God bounced you back, him past zero and him gone at 100, 200, he does exceedingly abundantly far more than you can ask or imagine. Come on, somebody. I feel, I feel church. And I'm telling you, when Joseph left... When Joseph left, good God, the, 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 the prison, he did not go back to his father's house. He went straight to the palace. God is able to bounce you back with more than where you were before. Amen, somebody? God is also able to bounce you back. And when he bounces you back, there is no damage. There's no damage to you. There's no damage. What do I mean by damage? It's like you're not coming in limping. You know, you're coming in strong and you're coming in with, with, with things different from how you used to look at it. Watch this. When Joseph was, was in, his, in the palace now, uh, the, the two things he did that was powerful. He named his two sons, Roel. He named his two sons these names. He named them Manasseh and he named one Ephraim. Manasseh means, means now, Manasseh means, God, you have made me forget. Come on, somebody. You have made me forget all the pain of my past. And Ephraim means, God, you have covered me and I'm surviving and, 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 and prospering in the middle of my suffering. So what did he do? He covered his past, yeah, by calling his son um, um, Manasseh. Because you know, how, how do I know he covered his past or he changed his mind? It's very difficult to look at a son every day that you call God, you have made me forget. And keep complaining, complaining all the days about what was in your past. If you name your son that, you're telling God, I'm committed. Good God. I am committed to calling my future what it is. And I'm committed to not sit back and keep living in the past. He named his sons. In other words, he named his future. That God, you have made me forget. And God, you are blessing me in my suffering. Here's my question to you. What do you name your picnic? And when I say, what do I, what you do you name your picnic? I'm not talking about, now. listen to me now. I'm not talking about your physical children. Because somebody might be saying, but pastor, I don't have any children. I'm not talking about the biological. I mean the spirit. What do I mean by that? What do you birth in your house? Do you speak ill? Do you speak um, worry and fret and, and misery? Or do you, when you speak, you birth things that, that, that speaks into your future? Come on, somebody. I mean, he could have named his, his son prison. Come on, somebody. He could have named one picnic prison and named the other one slave, slave because they're selling into slavery. He could have named one beat up. Come on, talk to me. And one problems and one missile. He never called him picnic missile. He said, listen, God, you have made me forget what, am I, what are you speaking in spite of the fact that you've been hit. Are you speaking about your hit more than you're speaking about your future and what your dream looks like? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah, I feel God in here. I feel God. Oh, God. Why do you want to make me do this preaching thing at this time of the day? Then we can't go through the rest of the show. I feel God in this place. And then the next one, the next, the last one, the last one, the last one is while, watch this now, while the world, while the world is, is, is bouncing down, God will make you bounce back. <laughs> Joseph when he did what he did, watch this. When he did what he did with, 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 the, with the government and, and saved the thing and the, and the grain and, and the wisdom that God gave him. Watch this. When he did that, he, he, it came to a place where when the famine came, Joseph and, and Egypt and, 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 and the, the king's house, the palace, had more, had plenty, while the rest of the people were, were, were suffering. What am I saying? God is able to prosper you right in the middle of a pandemic. I'm, I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Woo! You mean me, pastor? Yeah, because you belong to God. Then God, God does not depend on the economy and the world's you know, situation to line up to bless any of his children. I have never gotten a text or an email from God where he said, you know I'm supposed to bless you, but hold on, I'm going to wait on some material. 
I'm waiting for the Prime Minister to lose you. I'm waiting. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I'm waiting on the Prime Minister to change the economy. I, I, I'm waiting on the church to bless you. I'm wait, waiting on your music to sell. I mean, no, no. He has never, he, he, though he will use them, it, it, it does not tie his hands. God can bless you in the bounce back right in a pandemic. I hope somebody got that in their spirit today. God is able, God is able to what to do what? God is able to change your situation right where you are. Make your coming not limping. Amen, somebody? God is also able to make your bounce back greater than where you were before. Believe God. Trust God. Hallelujah. Your time is here. Your bounce back is here. Change your mind and receive it. Amen, somebody? I hope you are blessed by that. That's what we, we, we preached on this morning in church and the church was on fire. If you don't have a church home, hey, let me give a shameless plug. Fa Family Word and Worship Church. We're at 6 Belmont. Belmont Road, yeah? Uh, you can call us, 876-539-1050. 876-539-1050. We'll be more than happy to have you. We're also on social media, YouTube, all that good stuff, Family Word and Worship. The topic for today, the topic for today, ooh, I'm so glad we're doing, doing a second one to this because I felt like we left last week and we didn't really deal with the solutions. We touched on it. But because I don't, I don't want us to just keep having a, a, a emotional conversation about the, the, this thing called the rape culture and what's going on right now in our nation. Well, to be quite honest with you, I've always felt like it's not what's going on right now, as it to say it's new. It's been happening. I think we in social media and we as a in the world, and everybody on TV station, right, right in them, them phone. So I think we have caught up and learned how to connect and to show what's going on. But it's been going on from, from ever since we are there. We need talk the truth. Yeah? And, and so today we're talking about the church's response, the church response to this um to this rape culture. Let me give you a little recap real quick. Last week, past uh Pastor Courtney, Pastor Courtney, um, you know, Morrison, Pastor Courtney Morrison, you know, um talked about, you know, what the men should be able to do and what, what we as the church need to get involved. And, and the different programs and teaching about, you know, the, the father. And there's a, a lady, Sister Sharon, who came on and she was talking about, you know, the conference that she had where, the, you know, she was charging the church to, to be more mindful, pastors to be more mindful about this thing of rape culture and what happens to people when they come to the church. Because a lot of people comes, you know, they come into the church and they're like, you know, boy, I'm hurt. But they don't know if they're comfortable enough or if they can trust the church to, you know, to, to, to hear what's, what happened to them look at them any different. They, they don't want to walk around, you know, they don't want to walk around looking in the church like, you know, oh, boy, all the eyes are on me because I'm the one who came out. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to, to, to bring up, why, why I felt I needed to have this, this, this part too, is that some, some conversations were going on last week and I kind of felt like I'm not sure if I was totally, under, you know, understood what, as to what I was trying to, to, to convey. Um, they, they, we, we're looking at the different entities in this whole thing of the rape culture. There is the person who, you know, makes, makes the offense. And then there's the person who was offended, right? The victim. And then there's we, the society. And when I say we, the society, you know, that's a broad thing. That is culture. That is music. That's movies. The things we do. The church. The preaching. I mean, ev you know, the government. The police. You know, uh, the laws. And all of those kind of things. And, and um, you know, whose responsibility is it? To speak up, whose responsibility is it to take charge? And, and and when I was trying to really come across and bring across it, I believe it's all of us. Put it this way: I don't put any onus or anything on the on, on the on the um the the, the perpetrator to, to speak up. Nobody, I don't I, I don't know if anybody can want to you know give give themselves in because them them feel guilty. That happens probably very rare because most times the person who does something like that is. Obviously, I mean, oh my God, they're either in a prop them in a problem, or them them they must not in them right mind, or them just wicked and evil. And evil people get want to get away with evil, so I can't I can't depend on them to turn themselves in. So the, the the people now who have been victims, don't get me wrong, and I want to make this very clear again. By no means I would ever put that responsibility in the per, that per, person's lap because listen, I've never been a victim of that. And trust me, even just to think about it, as a, as, a, as, a, as a brother, as a cousin, yeah, as a man who grew up in, a, in, you know, in certain environments, you, you see abuse and you've, and you've heard of it. And you, just, just to be 
just to be disconnected from afar from it, it hurt. So I will never even try to say, but I you know, imagine, I can imagine what the victim feels. So when somebody says to me, I don't want to come forward and say, you know, because I, I don't want to you know, process, I don't want to, I don't want to um, go to relive. Nobody should ever challenge them and, and criticize. Gla guys, I've seen some of you on social media and you're cussing the, the women. And I, listen, come on now, man. Come on. You are not in their shoe. You don't know. Don't even try to do that. However, in the same token, we want to encourage them. We want to make sure we set an atmosphere and set up things in the right way that will encourage them. Because I believe, I believe the strongest weapon in this whole fight or one of the strongest strong weapons in this whole fight is for the voice of the victim to say, this is what happened to me and this is the person. Amen. So this conversation today going forward is about what are the solutions? What can the victim do? What can we do as a society to strengthen the hands of the victim? And even what we are doing ourselves and not doing. Where is the church in all of this? Yeah? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. We're going to go to a break and we'll be right back. Pastor Junior Tucker, you are on the baddest station on the planet, The Bridge 99 FM. And we're going to have a great show today. I'm telling you, I feel it. We're going to have a meaningful, really powerful show today. It's a continuation of last week, but this time we're going into the solutions, the solutions. Please join me on, 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 you know, on the show. Please join me on the bridge. Like I said, the bridge is an invitation to a conversation. You are you are invited if you're on social media. The Bridge 99FM from Jamaica to the world, right? Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We're at the Bridge 99 FM, at the Bridge 99 FM. Instagram, if you want to speak to me directly, I am Junior Tucker on Instagram. Facebook, Junior Tucker. Hashtag Junior Tucker on the bridge. We're going to start the conversation off with a lady, powerful lady. Um, her name is Sharon Coburn Robinson. Um, Miss Sharon was a part of the section that they, they had just the other day. Um, the government passed a sexual harassment bill. And when I saw that, I was like, yes. But to be quite honest with you, um, maybe like you, uh, <laughs> it, uh, people out there in the world, in, in, a, in regular Joe like me and you, we really don't understand fully what that act means. We can't, like layman's, we, wanna, we don't want to figure it out, layman's term. And I'm so glad on short notice I could reach out to this lady and she was so willing to come and speak with us because Miss Sharon, let me, let me read this a little bit. This is, I think it's a blessed people. Miss Sharon Coburn Robinson uh, is, is connected in integral part of the, the implement, implementations of the national policy for gender equality as well as coordinating the qualitative dimensions of social policy and action research. What does that mean? The ladies sit down in another room with the people who put these things together and she's, she's, she's a part of the planning. She works it. She, she serves this nation. She serves people. She don't want to serve women. She serves the nation. What an important work this is. And I'm so glad to have you, have you on. Miss Sharon, welcome to On The Bridge. Thank you so much, Pastor Tucker. I'm very happy to be on. Okay, so can you help us to us real quickly, um, as quickly as much as you can, in layman terms, to the man who are listening now and don't understand. Then you know, pass a bill, what that mean? What what does that really mean? Especially in this climate of what we're dealing with with, with rape culture. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay. So to break it down, because you know, it's very jargony, but I want to say so that the average person can understand. So sexual harassment has a specific definition. Yeah. It's quite long, but it simply means unwanted, unwelcome overtures, or uh, sort of like when people make passes at you that you find uncomfortable. So they look at you a particular way, they group parts of your body, and the, the gaze that you get is something that suggests that they want to do something to you that you are not okay with, yeah. and it is not in, you're not in agreement with it. It is... Uh, it is humiliating to you. You find it annoying. It can shut you down where you don't want to come to work, where you, um, you come to work, but you're not performing because it's affecting your psyche. And it is something that we find pervasive. Now, it is a gender neutral bit of legislation. I know you'll be happy to hear that. Yes. So it looks at harassment to men and harassment to women because the record shows based on the statistics we have and the reports we have only, there's no one person that experiences sexual harassment. Men experience it, women experience it. And so what we want to do is to make sure that whether you're a male or a female, you have the right to complain. So this has been on the 
the, the table for a long time, from as early as 2004, when we had our consultations. And we're very happy, Pastor Tucker, that it was approved, finally, because there are so many persons who are waiting on this bit of legislation, because for years, persons were facing sexual harassment in the workplace, in accommodations, in schools and institutions and accommodations, and nothing was happening because there was nothing legally approved that could provide that protection. There were other things that you could get redressed under, but it took such a long time. And as you know, you know our, our system, we try very hard in the justice system, but because of the number of cases, to match the number of persons who are managing these cases, sometimes we have backlogs. Got and you. so what we wanted was a specific legislation that would speak definitively to this nature wow. that it's a pervasive nature that some persons have. And what we have found regrettably is that a lot of the offenses that are reported are reported by men, are reported by women who accuse men of accuse sexually me. harassing right. them. Okay. Uh, what we have found now is that men are coming forward and reporting. So I'm glad that Reverend Dona is on this call because he's a very vibrant yes. part of our male network. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna and get so he it. understands <clears throat> that when men face harassment, there is no discrimination to men reporting. As a matter of fact, they are encouraged to report because this legislation covers both male harassment and female harassment. As, and it also covers same-sex harassment because in some cases you have a female harassing another female, a male harassing another male. You find mm. that sometimes when people come into positions of power and decision-making and authority, they will want to harass somebody or they might use a privilege that they have to give this person who is a, 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 a somebody less than them of lower rank. So they are the superior person. They give this person the impression that they must accede to or give in to or succumb to an act of sexual harassment in order to get a promotion, to get a job, to get ahead. And so what we say is there is no obligation right. that any person has to accept an overture of sexual harassment yeah. because of something that you are going right. to gain. And you should not use your power and your privilege to gain an advantage over any person in the workplace, in the school, in accommodations, in any spaces, whether it's recreational spaces or spaces or anything. You should not use your power to cause anybody to feel as if they are obliged to succumb to say yes to a sexual advance. So, so, because in I'm, many cases, it can be this devastating. So devastating. What, so what I'm hearing from you, I'm hearing a couple of things that I just want to touch on. I'm hearing that there is justice, the Justice Department of our nation, but this is a, this yes. is something that is coming alongside for this specific reason, for this specific thing that we've been dealing with in our culture, in our nation, yes. to, to work with the Justice Department. And yes. and this was spearheaded by the minist, minist, ministry, by Minister Babsy, what, what's her? Your, Minister Olivia Grange. Minister Olivia Initially Grange. started with us and the office of the prime minister. Okay. We, we had, okay, so because of the change of government, whenever we are, we, whenever we change, there's another ministry. So whoever is our parent ministry, because at one point we were with the Ministry of Justice. And then when we changed, we were with the office of the prime minister. Got you. And then it went back to justice and then we got total carriage. So our minister now has total carriage of that legislation. Wow. But because of the legal implications, we still work with the Ministry of Justice. Because, and, and one of the reasons why I, I, I wanted to make this known yeah, it, why I went there, it's on purpose because in social media, people have asked these questions. What is Minister, you know, what is Minister Grange doing, you know, about what about this? And, you know, she's not she's not saying this and she's not saying that. And I wanted to say, well, OK, is, is this what she's saying? In other words, you guys are in the office working to, to make this happen and it, it's happening and you're now going to work it. And, 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 and this is a part now of this, the solution. This is this is a, a a tool for solution. Is that what you're saying to us? Absolutely, absolutely. So when the ministers bring the bill to, to to book and they take it forward, it would have been because of a number of bits of pieces of collaboration and consultations. Because as a government, gotcha. we have to have the consultative pool. So we'd have had consultations across Jamaica with different stakeholders asking them, what do you think? How do you think this bill should look and feel? How should it cover? these range of offenses that you want to make sure it, it is capturing. What is your take on it? How do you want it to look and feel? And how do you want it to affect you? What do you see as your role in it? And so it's, it's folding in 
of all of those. So that's why when we had the joint select, and I had the pleasure of being um, sitting at the joint select and representing the ministry, as well as the Bureau of Gender Affairs and National Machinery. So I could hear persons bringing their complaints, bringing their comments, bringing their recommendations, and just saying how they experience it and how they want to look and feel. So it was very, very broad in terms of the consultation. We didn't want to leave anybody out because we had the opportunity to bring all of the voices in so they could weigh in. Awesome. So, uh, the other thing you, you touched on, which I thought was very interesting, especially for my nation, Jamaica, which is our culture is, is, is one where man don't say nothing, you know, you man upon us, hold it and hold your thing and, and those kind of a things. The women, you know, are even afraid to even say something much less the men. You mentioned about men coming out and, and, and you know, feeling confident enough and to say, yeah, this happened to me and this is not right. Because, you know, I, I mean, trust me, I, in the days when I was growing up, you know, which is like, I'm talking like maybe some 40, 40 years ago, if you were to say that as a man, it's like, no, we, we are complaining about that. Like, you know, you're not a man. Then you, even your sexuality gets gets questioned and all these kind of things. But you're saying to me that you're seeing women, women are attacking women. Men are coming out to say they've been attacked by women. And that, that's an interesting dynamic in our time. How How is the ministry dealing with that? What are you seeing? Give me, give me the, the things you're seeing about that. Why do you think we're here? Okay. So the reason we want to make sure that men understand that they can complain and they're their case is no less important if it is that you have been harassed, whether you are male or female, whether you have been harassed by the same sex or by somebody who is your superior or your somebody below you, it could be a subordinate or, or somebody on the same, on par with you, your, your parallel person. Whatever, however, whenever. Once it is harassment, it is treated in the same way. So the same, same thing applies across the board. Men understand that through our special service desk for men, which works within a unit, it's a policy, uh, policy and research unit. They understand that when men come forward with a complaint, they are supported. Reverend Downer is a part of that network. Right. Reverend Courtney Morris is a part of that network right. where we encourage men to come forward and we look at solutions. We look at strategies. The how, how can we reduce this? How can we eliminate it? How can we prevent it? How can together we make sure that this does not happen? All right. So, so okay. Ooh, there's, there's so much in here. Man, man, we need three show, but, but we're going to try and do our best. But, but, but best. Okay. Um, what, if anything, is being done? So let me balance the thing now. What is being done, if anything, for the man now who is he's not a he's not he hasn't been sexually harassed but he's been accused and he is is innocent like what 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 is being what is what is his rights what, what are we considering that is that a part of the the whole thing or are we just l looking at those who have been victimized cuz cuz he yes. isn't he a victim if he's been accused and he didn't do anything and then his reputation his life his family is is in is in trouble Oh, absolutely, Pastor Tucker. There are times when there is uh, reprisals or sometimes it could be unrequited love, a relationship that has gone sour and somebody feels that they want to be vindictive and they might just lodge a complaint that is fallacious. It is not true. It's an allegation that doesn't have weight. And so what we encourage persons to do is to have your case written out. We allow for the HR to support you or you can complain to your supervisor and put everything in writing, document it. Everything that happened, when it happened, if you have anybody as affidavit, and all the persons will be a part of that. And we have the process where you can have a, a tribunal listen to your case, or if you're not there yet, you can have a committee listen to your case and look at it to see whether or not this was. And if the person is found liable of making a false claim, then the person is going to be charged. We believe that wow. persons must understand that you cannot just come out and say something negatively. So if it is that you did it because there was unrequited love and so on, then you have to do something that allows you to sit together or you do it separately by yourself, having a sort of counseling session. You know, you could have something that looks at restorative justice or something that looks at um, that counseling that allows you to talk about it. Why did you do this? And have some resolution. But it can't be that. You accuse somebody because in some cases the reputation is damaged forever and the person doesn't get a chance to come back out and clear his or her name. Okay. Um hmm. wow. So here's what here's what I'm th I'm thinking. I'm I'm thinking, Miss Sharon. Um so so you're saying this thing is a broad thing that, that basically then covers each every person. 
So yes. from where you sit in your chair, man, I, oh my good, I wish I could follow you to work one day and just <laughs> let's see what you do. This is a, this is beautiful work, right? So here's my question to you: as a nation, we is there's no secret, there's no way to put it put it pretty. We have really been, I believe, I think, from from where I sit. I, I don't want to use the word neglectful, or maybe as a society we have just not known our rights, so we don't come out and talk as much as we we should. We 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 um you know we so so what has been one of the most challenging things for you now? Like okay, there's a bill that's been passed, right? Bill has been passed. You're setting up the rights. You're setting up the the system. But is the people using the system? Are they aware that there's a system? Um, do are we, are you do you feel like sometimes you're fighting this culture, this invisible monster called this culture that thinks a certain way and then says, you know, boy, I don't want to go like. I've seen policemen who have told me their frustration. They come to the door and, you know, everybody in the whole neighborhood know that there's a domestic violence going on here. They come to the door and the man say, yo, what? Um, Law me, no. I'm, 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 I'm a woman. And the woman come and go, no, pass, no, no, officer is all right. And, you know, we're cool because of whatever, whatever. And you feel like there's a system, but nobody's working it. What's been, what, what's been your biggest challenge? And, and, then, and in the same token, what has been your best where you look at it and go, man, we're making strides in this. Go, go ahead. Okay, so in terms of the biggest, one of our biggest challenges, one would be, you know, hard-held stereotypes and entrenched notions that persons have that says, I can do what I want because I have a culture of entitlement. So if I want to broke somebody, that's my right. If I like this person, even if, even if the person doesn't like me, I have a right to come on to this person, make a pass at this person, and the person has no reason to object. So you do have some persons who have that culture of entitlement, and we call that in our space patriarchy, right? Mm -hmm. Another one would look would be um, this idea of the informal culture, where persons Ooh, think that on. if you speak about what happens wow. to you and you come out and say it outrightly, then you are an informer. And if you're an informer, there are penalties and there are repercussions. We want persons to understand that once something happens to you, you have that right as a person to complain, to make your complaint without feeling as if you are stepping on somebody's horn because you have rights. And a third one would be impunity. So you have some persons, Pastor Tucker, who think that because of their position, they have sort, sort of like impunity. So nobody can touch them, like they're untouchables. We understand that based on the constitution of Jamaica and all of these agreements that we have signed on to as a country, every person has an inalienable right to freedom of personhood, freedom of property possession. You can do what you should do as a citizen and you should be free to engage other persons as long as it is legal and above board and you are not going below what is required. And so if your right is breached by any person at any point, at any point in the life cycle, you have a right to redress you have a right to get your voice heard and you have a right to get whatever the penalties are for that person. In terms of our success stories, we think that the public education has been the greatest weapon. Yeah. Because when people understand why we're doing what we're doing and why we think that sexual harassment is a big issue and should be dealt with quickly, vociferously, swiftly, yeah. then persons say, oh, now I understand why this is important. Because for some person, when you talk about this, so what is if somebody just, you know, Tell you that they like you and follow you around and stalk you. What is so bad about that? Suppose he really likes you. You have to look at how it is received. Right. You have to look at the intention. What is the motive for doing it? Is it wholesome and healthy? Is it interfering with the person's ability to move around and do things freely? Does a person feel intimidated and scared? Will it affect their ability to perform well in their job, on their job, and will it affect their um, um, ability to come to work and to do well? Once you are affecting somebody in a way that makes them not perform as they should, then that is a cause for concern. And that means you are violating their rights and we do not look very lightly on violation of rights. Once it's violated, you must admit that you're wrong and face your consequences and change. Move to a path that says now you become aware, you have that responsibility to become a change agent and to do the right thing. Miss 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 Sharon, we, please stick with us. Stick with us for the for the rest of the show. I mean, we're gonna go back and forth on this, and we're gonna really flesh this out and try to be a blessing to somebody who's listening today. We're gonna take a music a music break, a, pra a praise break. Royalty by Samuel Medas. Take my breath away by Rondell Positive and Ball Out by Chosen. Come on. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah and Randall Positive telling about the lady that took his breath away. Yeah, and Chosen telling about him, Granny. <laughs> and Samuel May, that reminds us that we're all royalty. We must treat each other the right way. Last week, we, we played the ladies. If you notice, this week I'm playing the, the, the brothers, yeah? Because it's a unity thing, you know. It's something that affects both of us, yeah? It's something that affects both of us. When my sister hurts, you know, my sister, meaning my universe, our sister, my earth sister hurts, I don't take any sides. I don't take any sides. I mean, I, I, there's no side. It's the, I'm on the side of truth. I, you know, I don't want none of my sisters to be raped and to be abused. Yeah? No, I don't want that. And I, and none of my brothers to be locked up because they're, they're, they're the person who abused or, or got abused. And none of that. Nobody wins in this case. This is God's people being hurt, God's creation being hurt. And we are here for the solution. Um, Ms. Sharon, um, you, you, you were telling us, um, are you still there? Ms. Sharon, still, are you still there? No, I'm, I'm not seeing, I'm not hearing seeing her yes uh, I'm still here oh good 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 because um you mentioned some things a while ago chat I, I thought was very important just want to highlight because I want that I want the the, the 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 layman on the street the regular 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 man who you know just I listen to the program and I tune in and I, and I say okay what are you saying to me I wanted to make it clear what we are seeing then in this nation right now is two arms two arms of, of government that is working together to, there's just the Department of Justice, and then there's now the, the the Ministry of you know Gender Equality, um, that is that is um, that is working to to eradicate to bring solutions to this thing, and and you are working tirelessly. I mean, I'm I'm sure this thing takes a lot of work, um, you know. But we also need to understand we as people in our in this nation need to understand, be educated as to what is available to us. Yeah. Sometimes we our rights are walking around looking at us going, I'm here, but we don't know the rights that are available to us. So we keep quiet, we keep silent. And sometimes, you know, we, we don't we feel we don't have somebody who we could reach out to to say, No, you know, if this happens to me, this this is what this is my truth. Yeah. But I'm seeing it happen on social media and I'm seeing people, you know, speaking out and I, my heart goes out to all these people. So Miss Sharon, I just want to 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 you know commend you for you know the work that you are doing, and and you know, um, tell us tell us a little bit more about what are the, some of the practical things, some of the practical things that your ministry is doing to reach the people and to change that culture that you talk about that is there that you are, you know, um, you know, you know, you mentioned about you know education. T tell me about the practical things you're doing to to change that. Okay, so thanks again, Pastor Tucker. So we do public education in a number of ways. We have, let's say, campaigns. So I don't know if you saw. Recently, we had a no excuse for abuse campaign. Yes. And that campaign is sort of across Jamaica, all of the parishes, just saying there is absolutely no excuse for abuse. Nobody has the right to abuse anyone. No one has the right to accept abuse. And once you are an abuser, you must face your music uh, and face your okay. consequences. So, Michelle, one second. So, one, so Michelle, one second. Really, and before, uh, it, it, it slipped my brain. Because you mentioned earlier a, a very powerful thing when you said about the the snitching, the part of telling telling on people, right? You don't tell because yeah. you're in pharma. If you're in pharma, then it's like you get me. So so here's my here's my ch challenge in my brain, and you can help me on this. In a culture, because I know this about you know ghetto life and people, and even in our society, um, we we don't like rapists. You know that, that, that down in the ghetto, if you're a rape, if rape a man say you're not supposed to rape the body, cause man a man and you feel that. You know what I mean? So how does how do we know this? Don't make sense to me. How do you tell the person if you're in farm, you're in trouble, but then we don't want any rapists? How do you counter that now? What, what what's been your challenge in countering that to educate? The people know as to you know what's the difference and, and all that kind of stuff. Can you talk about that for a minute? Sure. So one of the things we have done, uh, Pastor Tucker, is that we have looked at networks that would allow us to be able to make a difference. So you mentioned earlier the partnership and the collaboration that works very beautifully for us. So we have a national strategic action plan. It's a big plan, and that plan is a 10-year plan. It's called NSAP GBB for short. And it has three layers, essentially. One layer looks at persons who are victims or survivors of gender-based violence. So something has been done to them, some act of violence has been done to them, and they're either a victim because it's still happening and they are not able to control what is happening, or they are a survivor because something has happened as an intervention to help them and now they can assist somebody and they can move away from the harm. They are probably in a shelter. They have moved away from the shelter. They are in a space where they have reintegrated in society. 
The second level looks at witnesses of violence. And sometimes a witness mm. is a child. Sometimes it's a community member. Wow. Sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's a bystander, a complete stranger. And the third layer looks at the perpetrator. So you mentioned the rapist. Yeah. That person would be considered a perpetrator. How can we help the perpetrator? Because in some cases, the perpetrator was a victim at some point and there was no intervention or there might have been interventions, but they were not successful. Right. And so the person is still carrying that burden, the burden, the hurt, the pain, the frustration and, and the burden or whatever it is. And that self-disclosure has not taken place. They haven't spoken about it and got it out of the system. And so we just crafted a new program that we're working with the Ministry of Justice under the Restorative Justice Arm. It's called RPP, Refocus Perpetrator Program. And that's because the NSAP makes provision for that level, which is a perpetrator. And what we have found is that persons who are perpetrators, in many cases, they don't know sometimes how to get help. And so they become repeat offenders. So we mm. have relationship with judges, for example, who are working in courts. And they will tell us that some of these persons come over and over to the court system because they have not been assisted to understand that this is wrong. So they move from one relationship to another, from one family to another, and wow. the hurt continues. Wow. What what do you say? What do you say to the to the to the victim, male or female? That what we say. What what, what so do you sorry. say? What do you say to the to, what do you say to the victim, who, male or female, who who would say, Miss Sharon, I hear what you're saying. All of that nice, and it's easy for you to say. You know, you know, in your government job, you're doing well. You're you know, powerful woman. All that kind of stuff, and you're nice. You're protected. But for me, in my world, I don't know if anybody would really hear me. Um, it's been my it's been my experience that you know as a matter of fact you know these perpetrators are really powerful you know the, the law really don't follow up I mean there are so many cases that I can tell you off the top of my head as a man who, uh, that I know are still you know not solved to this day and we're we're a small island I mean we we we, we know some things that we know when we know so so why should I why should I risk my 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 reputation my life my this go through this trauma what would you say directly to that person? What I would say to the person, person is you have to look at the why you want to do what it is that you have to do. So if you want to report, why are you reporting? If you don't want to, why are you keeping it a secret? And what is a long term? So if you keep it a secret and you don't say it to somebody, you might not want to say it right away because you might not have that element of trust. So you'd have to find out, for example, who would be persons that you feel that you can trust. So you must, you must know in your community who are the persons that you can trust. So you must know the justice of the peace. You must identify such person. Persons who are in church, pastors, and persons in church who you can trust. Because in some cases, it's not solved overnight. Okay. We have a case just now that this has been ongoing for many months. The person who was a case worker, she has left the bureau. She's with another entity, and it's just yesterday that the person came forward to say, I know I'm ready to do this because the person has been uh, contemplating it and has been asking the person, has been asking herself, why do I not want to just come forward to do this? What are the reasons that keep me from doing it? And what will happen to my children in the long run if I do not come forward and wow. get help? Mm. And so it's a number of things. You mentioned partnership earlier, Pastor Tucker, that is so very critical. We have what we call a referral pathway and that referral pathway sounds fancy, but all it means is that we have a number of persons on the ground who are poised to help those persons who need help. So it could be your neighbor next door who is a part of that network. And if they see something happening, sometimes you don't want to talk about it because of what can happen if you say it. You might say it to the wrong person and it gets out and you are in trouble. So you have to know how to say it and when to say it so that you get the help when you need it and it doesn't come back to bite you, it doesn't affect your family and it doesn't shut you down. So sometimes we say to persons, look around, be a neighborhood, um, you know, like a na your neighborhood watch. You don't have to be even in the system itself, but just look to see what is happening. If it's something looking suspicious, you can help by perhaps even sending a WhatsApp message to the person, sending a text message, making a note of it, sending it to somebody else, because the idea is we have to help each other. It's like the concept of the village raising a child. Yeah. The village raising Spe a child. Everybody has a responsible Sp role. And if we care about each other, we can work. It can work. Speak we just have to be a nosy neighbor. Speaking of help, let's I me and you alone are talk now. Let us turn off turn off everybody else. You know, the honest me and you me and you alone talk. Talk to me. Um <laughs> tell me the truth. Has the church helped? 
are the cho- church has helped in some cases past them, but not for some person. Some person would say the church has failed them because they might not feel safe enough talking to some persons. Um, so they might not necessarily want to disclose because they feel that if the church is not connected to the other parts of the machinery, so that when they get the information, it not just it doesn't sit there, but it is accelerated to the persons who can assist. So you are a part of a network. So there are case, cases where the church has helped, but in some cases the church has failed some right. persons. So, so speak. And so so sp- persons just try to make sure that they do what is right. So speak to the pastors now. What 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 do we need to do? Charge us now. What do we need to do? So I know some pastors who are clinical psychologists and they work with their team members. I laud them. I commend them. They understand what is happening and they reach out to persons. So if something is wrong, they'll even take their own vehicle and go and drive, pick them up and take them to where they can get help. But some persons are not as, should I say, hands-on, right? right? So they perhaps hear what is happening and they might not say it. That, again, is the whole concept of impunity and just turning a blind eye. All pastors have a responsibility to all of the persons that they serve, whether the person is a member of your church or not. You are a responsible person and you have that responsibility to look out for the person. You have a God-given responsibility to ensure that the flock is shepherded properly in all and areas of their depending life. On you. Yes. And even when they might not want to go to the police because they might be afraid to go to the police and traumatized to go to the police station, they should be able to go to their pastor or somebody else's pastor Come on. and say something and you do what is right to help that person, especially if they are not able to help themselves. A blessing, Miss Sharon. Please stay, please stay with us if you can, as long as you can, please. Um, I'm going to bring in, um, speaking of pastor, Reverend, the great Reverend <laughs> Donna. My God, my God. Reverend Donna, bless you, sir. Bless <laughs> you, sir. Come on in. Bless, bless thank, thank you for, for, peace, for and peace and love to you, sir. Um, you are from the, the great institution called the Purple the Purple One. The, 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 the <laughs> <laughs> so, so right away, my spirit does take care of me. I mean, me does love you as a brother right away. Right away. But most, imp- most importantly, sir, you are a man who serves this nation as a pastor. Am I am I saying saying it right? You are st- still pastor of the Movement of Faith Restoration International. Are you still connected with that church? Mm, was. was so so okay. I, I am no longer, uh, you know, I've given up pastoring within the four walls. Okay, you're the pastoring focus on people and, and, and outside. Like Got gotcha. so I fellowship at Christian Life Fellowship. So so what is <laughs> Mogava? Mogava? Am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. Mogava, man of God against violence. Yeah, it's men. Men of God. So it includes you. Yes, sir. Men of God against... Against violence and abuse. Violence and abuse. Yeah, sir, man. first of all, thank you so much for coming for coming on. Yes, sir. You've been listening. Um, talk to me. What? Do you, what? Do you, what? Give me your... Because your side is a real good balance in terms of your coming from the yeah. men's perspective. And, Definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah. big up to Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson. Somebody I love there. I'm not af- afraid to profess my love. Yes, sir. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Sir. And yes, I'm married. I'm not talking that sense. Right. Yeah. She's doing an Someone important work. Someone who supports work. me quite well. Yes. And um, really gives us the space. And I said, oh, it's not just me, but men, a voice as well. Um, so big up, Mrs. Rob. Um, and big up to Minister Bob Grange. Yes. And let me say this to you. She's, I think she's the hardest working woman in, 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 in government, in politics. Um, understand that her ministry is. Listen, she's the Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport. Wow. And she has a That's team a around her that helps her to execute her duties. Yeah. So big up, big up, big up to Bridge. Um, Mrs. Coburn has said a lot, um, especially with national policy on gender equality and, and speaking on all those things. A lot of times I ask her for clarity when it comes down to terminology. And she has shared that quite well. We have a problem in Jamaica. And... Um, I, you know, one of the things that, I mean, industry that is coming up big with it now, as we know, is, is where the music is concerned. Right. Um, and we are popular artists coming up where that is concerned and, and, and thing. Um, you mentioned some good points, and I'm happy that you raised the point. Because oftentimes when people hear rape, immediately they think of, one, the man, the perpetrator, which they mean they are. And two, um, what if a man is falsely accused? You know, what is there? you know, for some form of recourse, you know, my, my, my reputation, among other things, and, and Mrs. Robinson has spoken effectively to that. My organization, Men Have Got Against Violence and Abuse, 
which is one of several that is supported by the COPE initiative under the Bureau of Agenda Affairs. The Bureau of Agenda Affairs has been the first entity to say, you know, we love this movement and as partners with have partnered with us, still partner with us, has also sent me personally um, overseas to, to, to other, to other uh, what should I say, jurisdiction to, to learn more about, you know, you know, the space between man and woman, gender issues, Yeah. right? And so we really appreciate that. Um, one of the things we want, though, is for more persons within the church to, to be more aware of what is taking place. All right, sir, I'm going gonna, gonna to stick up in right there, and I'm going to go to sure. a commercial break, and then we come right back, and we can pick it up from Yeah, there. man, no problem. You're on the bridge with Pastor Junior Tucker. We'll take a break. You're back. We're back on the bridge with Pastor Junior Tucker. What an awesome um, conversation we're having. We're re I'm being really blessed. I hope you have been blessed. Uh, Reverend Downer was speaking to us before the break about his organization called um, Magava, um, which is Men of God Against Violence and Abuse. And Reverend uh, Downer was telling us about, um, you know, how the church can be involved, you know, about this, uh, you know, to, to try and combat, to try and help this nation against this, right. what we call the rape culture. So talk to us, sir. Continue. Continue. Yeah, man. So, so, so our organization, um, and of course others, because you have others as well, an internal nation, and several other organizations are there. It's two things we look at. We look at that the perpetrators need to be dealt with in terms of, I said, I don't, I'm not just speaking as it relates to justice in terms of serving time or go before the courts. I'm talking about being rehabilitated. I, I heard um, Mrs. Ramsey speak of the refocus perpetrator program, which I'm happy to hear. Okay. Never heard about that last year. I think it's November, December, when Minister Greenwich spoke about it when we had a special function um, at, at, I think, um, the Hilton Hotel, the Pegasus. So that is good because the truth is, if you, if you deal with the victims only, then we're going to have this cycle. You understand? And the truth is, when a perpetrator goes behind bars, um, at some point, he will be reintroduced to society. So if he's not rehabilitated, then there will be a problem. All right. Um, the next thing too. So on one hand, we have to be reactive. Yes. On the other hand, uh, we need to be proactive. It goes, it goes, it goes way back to the whole thing of parenting, specifically fathering and the modeling of, of what we call positive masculinity. You know, um, what we, we, we have a culture um, that promotes, unfortunately, a high level of toxic masculinity. You know, and I do believe that the way to counter that is when men speak to men, not just verbally, but what they model. And that more so must begin from the home. Now we have a problem okay. where the home is concerned. Well over 80% of the household um, where children are is led by women, a mother or a grandmother. So there we have a problem. So it means therefore, men who are in other areas of society, the church, or schools, which is a problem with the school because we don't have much male teachers or male guidance sponsor. The church need to find a way to step up and not just preach. Find a way to infiltrate the homes and the schools with positive masculinity being modeled to challenge some terminology that persist. So for example, sex yes. education, the typical teenage boy, in sex ed is from the music that he listens. You know, the girl and what we're gonna do her and certain the dagger in part of my language. And right. you know, no, so no, we no. not we right. need that to be countered. It has to be countered. And as uh, Mrs. Robinson pointed, there are many counselors within the church. And I'm not necessarily just talking um pastoral counseling or Christian counseling per se. That is good. And also it's good to pray and to fast, which we ought to do, and we have been doing. But near there needs to be some practical approach with rape, with domestic violence, intimate partner violence, there needs to be a practical approach in giving persons steps, techniques, ways to deal with problems that they have. We also, for those men who have a problem, a chronic problem, like we see now, we heard the news, the young lady thankfully was returned, the little girl was returned yes. yesterday. Yes. Then we hear now there's another, a 13-year-old. So it speaks to a psychological problem. We want it to become, in a sense, normalize the action when a man recognizes him, have a problem to seek help. 
And, and when we reach those root causes, then we will begin to see a dent. Okay. We so, can't just deal with the symptoms. We can't just deal with the victims. We have to go right, right at the root cause. Okay. okay. So, yeah, you, so, you, so you, you, you open up two doors to two, two rooms a while ago. So yeah. let, let me walk with you know, practically in them. First one you talked about, you said, you know, in the church and the, and the ministers and the people who are doing the counseling need to, you know, apart from fasting and praying and, and giving people scriptures, how do right. you practically now prepare? So are you challenging, are you challenging not only the minister, are you challenging the Bible schools that prepares the minister? To, to, yes, to, man, to, we don't know. Let, let me see. I, yeah. I, I, how do we I do that? Give me, the, give, me the, yeah, give me the practicality as to so, what so, the pastor so, so, should change so, and do. I am one, and, and let me say this. I don't know. The truth is, I can't. I, I, I studied at Jamaica Theological Seminary. Yeah. I did theology and guidance and counseling. I'm presently doing a master's in forensic psychology. Right. And I can tell you with JTS, the course is being offered at the highest level. Yeah. It's not a, about just hermeneutics right. and exegesis. Right. You understand? It yeah. is about introduction to psychology, developmental psychology, right. abnormal. So we are going in because we're taking care of people. Come on. And so in taking care of people, you need to understand the mindset. I want to believe other colleges that might not be at an international level like JTS, the better, the colleagues that I know within ministry, they too understand some aspect of it. But I want to challenge the notion to pastors who might go independent, feel a call to start a work, many believe and hold only to the notion that I don't necessarily need to go to Bible college or higher learning. I challenge that. I don't think you necessarily need to go to a JTS or a UTC, but it's very important that you find yourself in a space where there are other similar-minded persons that can give you perspectives and also understand the makeup of man. It is very important. And I, I just feel it's a cop out to say, I am anointed for the cause. I agree we're anointed. In fact, you don't have to have studied and receive your BA to have been called to be a pastor. Right. But if you have any interest in God's people at all, you will seek to be well-rounded and, 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 and really take on the whole concept of lifelong learning and also understand your limitations. If it is that somebody comes to you with a serious problem and it's beyond your training, it's not a sign of weakness to refer. In fact, the partnership what Mrs. Robinson spoke about, many churches, Four Square Gospel just opened a center called Life Center. I heard of another church in, in, in um, Cedar, Cedar Grove, I think. Mm -hmm. They opened a, a call center where you can call. These are the things we're talking about. So, so, so it's one thing, if anything, um, um, Pastor Junior, if anything COVID has taught us as the church, is that God's church can never die. And as such, we need to look at how we do church. And as such, look at the fact that church is not about the edifice. Church is about the impact that we have on people, the response we have to the issues we have in society. And so while on one hand, we have done a lot in the past. On the other hand, there's more to do. And on the next hand, we need to be out there. I, I, I made a, a social media post the other day, a, a YouTube post. I said, we have heard the cry from the church, and I'm generalizing because there's mm -hmm. exception. Sure. I'm hearing the cry from the church about the lockdown. And Sunday or the church, I get fired. If people understand church history, God's church can never die. Come on. Not saying I want to share concern. Right. But then the same person, when the little girl got taken, crime and violence, the little girl out by doing the part who got a gunshot, and you see the stains, you don't hear them coming out with the same level of passion and plea. And that is where the imbalance and it causes what is called us as the church losing some level of, of moral authority. It doesn't help either that we have hurt men these, these incidents of rape, sexual assault, it's in the church and we need to face up with it and say, listen, we have erred. This is what we are doing now to properly screen our ministers so that whenever there are issues too, there's a certain approach. We spiritualize everything and I don't think God is pleased with that. So those are some of the practical steps. The, the Ministry of Gender, the Bureau of Gender Affairs, they're an organized government, yes, but let me tell you this. And not because Mrs. Robinson is here and I'm somewhat close to her. It's an organized nation, Nardia, Dr. Peart, and I was calling first name. There are many others. Once you make a call and seek to reach them, 
you will get support. They will point you in direction. That's a level of network. You understand? And as such, I believe the church needs to tap into that. People are not short of hearing that Jesus saves and that Jesus loves. You understand? We've heard that. And we must continue to proclaim it. But people need to feel the love. And I realize there are many within the church who are trained in counseling, practical techniques. Let's utilize them. Let's utilize them. All right, let, and I think we need to activate that. Powerful, 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 powerful. Let me touch, let me clap on with you now and go to another side piece yeah. that I think is also very, very important. And you touched on it, but I want to, I want to sit there for a little bit. What if the person is in the church and they have been the victim, in other words, the, 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 the perpetrator, the, the predator, is somebody in the church, whether it's the pastor or, the, or a, a deacon, a brother, whatever, a, a, a believer in Christ, mm -hmm. yes, my yes. husband who is man of God in the church, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't say nothing because, you know, yeah. oh my God, how would it look if deacon so-and-so or pastor yeah. so-and-so? Because I, I've seen in my own eyes, boss, where I've had pastors who do certain things. We just don't hear about them for a little while and them shift and them start another work. Like you said, we start and our work. Restored. Right, and they're restored. I don't know what I mean. But so the point I'm making is yes, we're, we want to train the, the pastors to, to teach more, be more sensitive right. to the whole human thing. But who's also policing us as the church? Let me speak as a pastor. Who, yeah. Who's policing us? Are we policing ourselves? How, what do we Ex do to deal with that? Excellent point. And that is one of the problems we have. Um, the accountability is very low. And, and, and also accountable to who? You understand? is very low. Because why I say that? There are many churches that a man just start a work. One, a man must be free to that, do that, among other things. But what we find, men who start the church, they are, what they can do, they can deliver a good message or a motivational speech. But they lack other skill sets as it relates to shepherding and guiding. Pastor. Pastoring. Yeah. And people don't understand that pastoring has less to do with how well you can articulate a point. Come on. And more of the heart and how you deal with people and guide them and facilitate them and take them to another level. What needs to happen among ourselves as pastors is a level of accountability where we need to just stop pray and push under the carpet. And then when somebody come and say, boy, I will see them for a while, I will say they have been restored. Justice must take its course. And believe you me, whether again it's domestic violence, sexual abuse, whatever it is, I know of persons who they are afraid now to speak out because they have done so in the past, but because he's a, he's a senior member or whatever it is, they can't afford to lose it. It will look bad on the church. It doesn't go further than the leadership of the church. And so what you find, not only does that cycle continue, but the children within the home are now damaged and they have, they have wounds, etc. So the church, whether you're big and a part of a larger denomination or individual church, if you're a pastor and you're listening to this, after you intervene, you need to get the law involved. And I'm happy that the law pretty much stays, especially when it comes down to minors, that even if you're aware and you do nothing about it, you must be called to give account. That's what needs to happen. And each of us within the body of Christ need to understand when you speak about brother's keeper, what that means. It's not just about food. It's about those who are hurting and that we can do something about it and allow the law to take its course. That's what I have to say about it, Sir Junior. So somebody comes to the pastor and says, Pastor, you know, I've abused so and so and so. I've, I've done this, I've done that. But the pastor is in confidence. You know, because <laughs> you know, the person coach. shared this with me as you know, in, in, in their counseling. You know, mm. if I say something about this person, I'm going to mess with my counseling I'm a, or my pastoral role. And I'm also yes. messing with a tithe that may walk through the door. You understand? Uh, yes, you, you, I want you understand to. me? So, 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 what do I do by law? What do I do as a pastor? What, what does, does the church need to rethink how we handle these things? I, I, I think they, I think they should. The truth is, as I said, generally the church bodies are looking at these things. But the question is, how does that filter down to a man who have a little following of twenty and he meet at X place? 
You understand? How does that message reach him and how does he you now take that message and do what is required of him? In anything in counseling, you must state very clearly your client or clients. And they must know the law requires you to report certain things. And the most you can do, even as a minister, an adult come to you and he did something wrong. You must, as a minister, I believe, appeal to his conscience or her conscience and say, do the right thing. The mercy that we speak of, once you do the right thing, allow the law to make that happen. Allow the courts. It's hard enough, Sir Junior. <laughs> me not tell you, what I'm telling you, me, me not tell you, say it easy. Me not lying. Me not tell you, say it easy. But the truth is, we have to begin somewhere because we have lost our way at some point. Or sorry, we are losing our way. So we all have work to do. Yes, man. And the work is social. The work is educational. The work is, is spiritual. The work is, um, and when I say education, I don't want to run past it. It's education to the public, to the people who are, who, 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 it's been, who have been hit. And it's also educational to us as stewards, as the pastors. You know, yes. when, when I went to Bible school, I was, I was, I was, doing, I was doing theology. And the Lord spoke to me and said, okay, you're, you're halfway through your degree in theology. And the Lord said to me, change and do secular psychology. And I was like, what? And what? I did three, three and a half years of, of, sec, of, of psychology. And I'm so glad I did because that's most of my pastoral work right now is counseling Boom. and taking care of people. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to follow my path. But, right. but, 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 but what, I'm, what I'm hearing you say as a charge is for us to, to broaden ourselves in the perspective of what pastoring is. Yes. And then how we operate as a church to hold each other accountable. To also work with Miss Sharon as, a, as government to, in, yes. in, the, in the minute we hear something, send them to, to let the people in our congregation know that these entities are, are working for um, you exactly, and not exactly. against you. Yeah? And so that we all collectively can start to affect the, 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 the atmosphere where the victim can then feel like, okay, you know, there's, there's more for me than is against me. Amen. We'll take a break and we'll be right back. Christopher Gale, featuring Jermaine Edwards. Then you heard a little, a little snippet from my brother. I, I you know, <laughs> I like to think of him, think of him as a Reverend Barry Salmon. And I speak that. <laughs> I speak it. Because I believe it in my heart. I love him. He's my brother. Known for nearly a boy. The Reverend Barry Salmon with giving thanks. And then there's Hallelujah with Jermaine Edwards. You're on the bridge, the baddest station on the planet, the bridge 99 FM. And you're on the bridge with Pastor Junior Tucker and my guest today, in Reverend Jason Downer and Miss Sharon. Miss Sharon is still here? She's there? Yes, she is. Miss Sharon Robinson. Bless God. I, 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 see you. Yeah, I see you there. Bless your heart. There, we, we've been talking and we've been having a very powerful um discussion this is part two just in case you you um you know you're just joining us and you you know missed the whole thing before we this is part two of the church's response to the rape culture and um you know we are definitely no doubt about it we are definitely hit with a monster that is really to be quite honest with you as a jamaican who live a foreign and did live a foreign for a while i came back home to serve my nation I came back to save, serve my people, to be a blessing to them. So anything happened to my nation, you know what happened to the the little girl as a man who have four daughters, you know to, to uh, you know to see her come back home and her you know her father was so blessed, you know when they found her the, the little girl in Saint Thomas. But there's another one that's missing, and there's others that we probably don't even know of or don't didn't get the attention that you know, the, you know this this little girl get. As somebody who see these things and see the people on social media who have confessed what has happened to them, you know, all the different artists who are coming out and saying, this happened to me, that happened to me. Listen, man, these things hurt my heart. These things hurt my heart. As a man who love him people and love him nation, you know, not my Jamaica, you know what I mean? Not my people. That's how I, that's how I feel about it. And so I'm glad to have people who are making the difference, trying to make the difference out there, not just talking and criticizing, but you know, really making a difference, Reverend Donna, Miss Sharon, I want both of you to come in now, if you don't mind. Um, turn your mics on, please, both of you. And um, because because um, 
we've been talking about solutions and we've been talking about what we what we can do and guys listen you, you, i still want to hear from me from me from you out there in bridge nation we, like i said we, we our intention is never to preach at anybody our intention is to have a conversation i would really love for you to even have one after the show is finished just talk to your family talk to your friends you know talk to your pastor you know say pastor what do you feel about that you know kind of a thing uh, 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 Rev, let me ask you this, Rev. Um, I asked Miss Sharon this question, so I want to ask you: What do you say to the woman, to the man, who has been living with this culture of of who we are as Jamaicans and how we do things when it comes to this abuse thing and rape and you know how man feel about woman and all them kind of a thing? Uh, um, but now we're seeing solutions and we're seeing you know people trying to make a difference. But the person may say, no, but me's a victim and me not feel, I feel that the deck is stacked against me. Why should I come out? Why should I say anything? Why should I call the person's name? You know, because that person is powerful or the society or the, or the, the system don't help me. What would you say to that person as a man of God who has been dealing with people who go through these things? Well, well first of all, personal healing is in that. It, it, being able to, even if you don't come out publicly to the general public, coming out to someone, let's say firstly in confidence, someone who is able to listen, it helps the individual to continue or to begin the process of healing. I, first, I could be wrong. I don't believe that when you have gone through something like this, and you tell no one, I don't think you have begun to be healed. I think, you, I think you're suppressing something and you're covering up and you're holding back yourself. That's one. Two, speaking out, no matter if you believe statue of limitation has passed. So, I'm sorry, Rev. I'm sorry, Rev. Say the first one again. You don't believe the person has been healed. I don't believe that if you have gone through an RB like this, traumatic experience like this, I don't believe that you can get full healing in its physical sense without full. speaking to someone. Okay, full. Okay. In fact, in fact, okay. one can argue that maybe healing you. hasn't completely begun. One can you're argue. trying to cope and you're suppressing. And when you suppress, Jamaican saying pressure bus pipe. That's one. Two. Okay. As human beings, we should be concerned about our fellow human beings. And I do believe that once you begin to speak, the more you will realize I don't want to use the term responsibility, which is at burden, but the more you realize that when you speak, it can help to prevent and also to hold the other person accountable. You don't have to come out and say the person's name as yet, but when you begin to speak, I believe it attracts, especially now there are so many advocates you hear, and I can't say her name now because it's public, Tanya Stevens coming out and she's speaking about those who are coming to her now and she said, listen, I can't help myself, etc." The point I'm making is when you speak, it will attract those who want sensationalism to find, but there will be some genuine persons who it will attract, who will guide you in the right way. And so I want to say that to you. I also want to cap this off. I always say to people, Accept the past, engage the present, impact the future. Don't do it without God, which is actually the first point. The part that you have had thus far, and I see Mrs. Robinson, I see here, I see, I see, I see other persons on the link here, resurrected Garvey, which is Stacey Garvey on the, on the thing here. We persons have had a past, or had issues, had circumstances. Don't just bury it. Use it to propel you forward. When you see a long jumper, they don't just stand up and run. They rock back in the past behind them to gain momentum. Mm. And I'm saying, use your experience. Even if you believe that you won't get any form of justice, you can get justice for the next person. And you can stop the person. But I do believe that even though you might believe you won't get justice, there's justice for you and you will smile again. So talk to somebody. There are many persons you can talk to to steer you in the right direction. Don't keep it inside. Don't mild you inside. Freedom is there. And Christ will help you and guide you along the way through his Holy Spirit. 
how do we how do we going going forward change the culture somebody last week mentioned you know we we are we are you know big you know we're no word running our mouths and talking about you know yeah. um, the whole thing of um you know we, we we'll beat a rapist but but then in the same token it's a common thing to say we we'll hold on and take Mm. As if to say, in our minds, we don't understand it's the same thing. It's like, I, I yeah. even mentioned the whole thing of cousin and cousin boil good soup. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. We, we, and we, would, we would think that's, that's okay and we actually even think it's funny. It's kind of right. cute. But the truth yeah. is, you are actually raping your cousin. That's what you're, you're yeah. doing. So, so how yeah. do we straighten out those crooked parts, Rev? <laughs> Give me 30 seconds on that. How do you, how, how do we, like you're speaking to men. You're speaking to men a lot. Right. And uh, by the way, sir, publicly, I'm telling you, we need to link up after the, after this, so oh, how well, I can get involved. All right. <laughs> so 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 how do we how do we personally, publicly, I mean, and technically, you're speaking to the men. How how are you doing that to change their their cultural awareness and the lingo, the the, the belief system, mm -hmm. so that, that, that okay. they can do all different. Right. All right. So I, I, I'm sure my good friend, Reverend Courtney Morris, might have shed some money. One. So we take a proactive and reactive approach. So, but reactive in the sense that God has given me access in the prisons. You understand? Okay. So, so, so in there, we're using that and we're engaging men, men who have done some things, some really serious stuff. So we're using that. And we have seen this, some of these men coming out the other day, we were in Price Mart with my wife and a gentleman said, how you doing? I mean, I wonder. And he said, Fathering behind bars. And immediately I remember because we ran a program in St. Catherine Prison called Fathering Behind Bars. And he's talking to me. And we have a lot more like that. So that's one. On the other hand, we are in the school system. Mm. And we are also, we are getting a lot of churches now, you name them, calling us to come in and help them to do some internal audit in terms of personal approaches, etc. And so we are pushing mentorship on a big scale and fatherhood and recognizing that we have that deficiency in the family, we're saying to other men, everybody who comes in your space, whether it's at work, at school, wherever, you own such a person, especially if he's a young man. And wow. on making persons wow. understand that mentor means men taking on responsibility and that, and, and that you have a responsibility not to create minimis, but to create and to facilitate youngsters who will become the best version of I themselves. I like, I like to think of it as not mini me's, but mini improved me's. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that is what we are doing. And at the same time, we hold hand with sister organizations and we partner. You mentioned earlier, we can operate separately. As men, we need our women and our women need our men. But I realize that in this message of the real culture, men respond to men differently. When a man go to a man and say, no, your approach is wrong. No, me, no. When a man can say, I have been there, I'm going to use a term, I have been aroused, I have been in a situation, but the lady get turned off and she said, no, I have to stop. And so you can do it too. We need man to begin to talk like that. Come on. Then every man need a man. That's all now way, but I say it. No, no, you mean. You understand? You mean? Modeling, modeling manhood. That is what is needed. And so me I charge every month. The man, they want to sing about the dance and music. I call out some of them the other day. And I say to them, we're not blaming you for the ills, but you're, there is a factor. Let's not deny that it. whatever you spew, our youngsters are so impressionable. We're saying, use your medium for the positive. Yeah, you're, you're, and that may yeah, talk about. You're contributing to it. And that's how we are engaging thing, yeah? Yeah. Bless Sister, Sister Sharon, I'm going to give you the last two minutes. Go ahead. Tell me. Thank you, Pastor. I mean, I love sharing space with Reverend Donor because we complement each other. You know, we're like tag team. Yeah. He talked about the idea of just coming out and speaking it. There's also the, in, the, the importance of empathy. So how you listen to it, how you take it on, how you help the person is very important. Not judgmental wow. and discriminatory, but you, you take this person um, and you, you extend the trust. Yes? And we are faith persons. And so we understand that this idea of that human compassion and the human um, the milk of human kindness is very important how you're going to restore the person i like the idea that you talk about many improved me and so we have some programs now and um rev talked about some of the males program that he's looking at we also work with mogava to look at men who are doing fantastic work and the reason we always want to talk about men rev 
is that men are very important to the discussion. Because if you're going to have the, the statistics showing that a lot of the perpetrators are men, then you cannot ignore that fact because you'd be like burying your head in the sand like the ostrich. So we have to speak to them to say, what are the issues that are very much on the table and how do we work with them and attack them one at a time, doing it right, doing it over a period seamlessly and working with all of the partners that are a part of this mix, you know, the partnership. I just want to say here, um, Pastor, I don't know if you know about International Men's Day, but I see you as a very important person in this space. So if you have not yet started talking to your congregation about International Men's Day, here's your opportunity to do so. It's November 19th. And every year we do a wow. big shebang with Mogavo and other men who are part of the network. Received. And we're so calling you into it this year yes. because that's a couple of weeks from now. Yes. International Men's Day, a very big thing. And I think because of what is happening now with this trust element, we're... There's a breakdown of trust where men are concerned. Some people are afraid to trust men, even in relationships and outside of relationships. At community level, in workplaces, there's a trust element, a huge deficit of trust. And so we believe that this November could be a start to bring the voices together and to bring the church in a more definitive way. Because we do have some men who are already on, on board, but we need everybody yeah. to be on board. And, and the victims... And all. And the victims need to know, and the victims need to know that the only person is is their enemy, is the one who per, who, who who um you know, uh, violated them, That's and correct. not every man That's or every woman. That's correct. Thank That's you correct. so much. They need to know that they are within a space that allows persons to be able to assist them. They, they don't want they don't want them to think that they're alone, and they are That's just it. struggling and hitting their, their heads against a wall. They need to know that they are within a system, and the church is that panacea that can allow that buffer and that space that is real. You know, I, I can't remember if I've ever done an interview that has really felt so connected to what, what I'm doing. This is really, I'm thankful to you for um, allowing me to be here because I think this is my best interview ever. And I'm serious. And that's because it is so, I had to wipe tears from my eyes just now between when I closed my mind because it is so real. I'm talking about Praise it God. and I am affected by it because I really believe what I'm saying. And I know that Reverend Downer believes what he's saying too. And I connect with you, Rev. I know that you're doing a great job and I know you are a person of influence and this program is poised to do much more. So I'd love you to bring us back to talk some more about International Men's Day and about yes. IDEFO. Yes. So that's November 25 to December 10. 16 days of activism. You got it. You got it. That's my word to you. That's my word to you. Bless you, bless you guys. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for Thank allowing you. me to be a part of this. I'm learning. I'm, I'm back and I'm here to serve my nation as best as I can, as, as God leads and, and empowers me to. Thank you so much for involving me if I, even for this brief time into what you guys are doing. You're the real heroes. Trust me. You guys are the real heroes. You know, you are carrying National Heroes Day today high, high, high because you're doing it today. You're continuing the work that our heroes have, have done. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We yes have, up, we, man. Bless you too, Thanks sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. We, 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 we have a, a feature that's, that's uh, we, normally at this time we would play Pastor's Playlist where I would, you know, play some music that uh, you know, I'm listening into, into my, I, I, I call it, you know, I want well, to call it now because me, me old school, you know, iPod, iPod, all that kind of good stuff in my earbuds. All them kind of, I, I, hey, listen, I just listen to music. <laughs> and, um, you know, normally around this time we play some music, but we're going to do something different because today is Heroes, Heroes Day. Tomorrow is Heroes, yes, National Heroes Day. T it does feel like the whole weekend to me is for the heroes. That's what it feels like to me, the whole weekend. You know, and especially though the Prime Minister does, the terrible fellows keep quiet and just be, you know, be quiet. Oh God, as we reflect and bless the, the, the heroes for what they have done for this nation, I just want to um, highlight our modern day heroes, unsung heroes, people who are, you know, um, have done some great work and is doing some great work. So this is our unsung heroes feature and we're going to be doing it all this week on the bridge. This is who, who the bridge, this is the station we, you know, we, we, we are, we love our nation. One of the people that we want to highlight today, her name is Stacy Ann Garvey. She's been so patient, so patient. Look at, oh, bless your heart, lady. Let me tell you, you've been really patient just listening and stuff. Have you been, have you been blessed so far? Yes, I have been extremely blessed. Thank you for thank you for being here. You listen to me, no man. When I read your your listen to me, no man. You alone need about three show. I mean, your story <laughs> is un that, that's not unbelievable. It is believable because with God, all things are possible. But you are just something else. You are truly a hero. 
standing here looking at you. And you look pretty too. You just pretend to shine so like said, so nothing ever happened to you in your life at all. You are really, truly a hero. Tell us a little bit about your story and then tell us about um, your organization and, and what's going on with yeah, what's going on with you. So good afternoon, Pastor Gina Tucker. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So my story is basically a mess that got turned into a message. Um, you know, I grew up having a horrible past. I suffered serious rejection and depression. I started doing drugs and alcohol, uh, leading to criminal activity. I got 10 years in prison. I met the Lord in prison. I encountered love for the very first time. And that was what led me into transformation, you know, and freedom. And so I've held on to God since then, falling in love with him more and more. And so because of that experience, that encounter, and just holding on to God, I've been able to walk into purpose, walk into destiny. Uh, the organization that I operate is called Resurrected Garvey Ministry. It's a prison and a community outreach ministry, basically a charity organization. And some of the work that we do is to go into the prisons, you know, evangelize, we bring care packages, we cater to the needs. We go into communities basically every week, uh, communities way out in the country. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we feed the homeless. We take grocery for um, persons that are in need. We take items of clothing. Uh, we have assisted children going back to school with tablets and textbooks. And the list goes on. So, you know, we, we use the opportunity to evangelize Christ and to really share, you know, the practical love of Jesus Christ to, to show that he not just cares about us in the spiritual aspect but also the, the, the physical aspects as well. So for, for somebody who's listening, they would they probably think and say, okay, so, you know, you had a rough time and a rough life and, you know, you came to a desperate place. So, you, yeah, I can understand you turning to God because you're desperate, you reach a certain place. So you could have helped people. You could have helped poor people. Why Christ? Why are you bringing, why Christ is your brand? Why are you bringing Christ? I mean, you could have feed people and say you, you love and you want to do a social work. But why do you come with the, the, why personally are you coming now with this, this, you know, this thing of Christ? Why Christ? So there's a scripture, Psalms 8, you know, where David talks about what is man that you are so mindful of him. Growing up, I always wanted love. You know, I, I suffered serious rejection. There was just that element that I knew was missing. And going to prison, having all of those bad experiences and having that one encounter and just tasting and feeling and, you know, having that tangible you know, experience of, of the love of God. It's something that I hold dear. I realized that I just existed without Christ. I, I was just mere flesh, a mere man walking around. And because of that one day, that one that one minute, that one hour, when he poured himself into me, wow. I realized just how powerful the love of God is and what it is able to do. And I don't want to be selfish with it. I want to spread it. Come on. So the Lord opened up a door, an opportunity for me to share physical things and to do physical acts of kindness. But I want to give them more. I want to share with them what I experienced. And listen, from that experience, it has caused me to maintain who he has transformed me to be. And I believe that this is something that, listen, it's transferable and people can do it. And listen, it, 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 it goes on. And so it's because of the love of God. I, I know the power of the love of God. I, I, I know how powerful it is and how it is able to change situations and lives. So that's it for me. So it's 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 more than a meal. It's more than you rescuing people off the street. It's more than you talking to a prisoner and telling them there's hope beyond the prison. You have a tangible, touchable relationship with a God who's not a, a theory in a book. You have a real relationship, and you're 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 trying to on top of the meal, you know, you're trying to introduce them to that to that. Or else you kind of feel like you left them half half done. You don't want them <laughs> cured. You want them whole. Yes. Good God Almighty, I, f I feel God. Yes. That's powerful, That's woman of God. How do how do people how do you do that? You know, how do you 
I mean, everything takes takes resources to, to do in the earth. We're, we're in ch trapped in time. We're on earth. So you can pray and get spiritual. But let's practically know, <laughs> how do you do that to, to, to feed the people and go into the, to the, to the, the prisons and do your ministry? You say you have places where you go out of far a country. How you travel? <laughs> how do you do that? And who, how people can help you to do that? So, you know, starting full-time ministry is a challenge for me because it is something that I was really afraid of. But the Lord said to trust him. He said that he would send the right partners and the right support system and the right persons to, you know, join the team and the person that would catch the vision. So one of the things that we, and, and I also have a book that I get support from that is able to carry the ministry. You know, we put out there what we do and persons partner with the ministry. And, and so this is how we are really able to go out there and do what God has called us to do and, and remain consistent. So, you know, there are persons that partner with us. There are persons that support us with items. There are persons that watch us from all over the world, you know, who will send food items, who will send items of clothing to, to really and truly keep us going. How do people reach you? Give me all of the details. So our email address is resurrectedg. Resurrected, resurrected G Ministries at gmail.com. Our contact number is 876 440 6019. Our Facebook page is Resurrected Gavi Outreach Ministry. Our Instagram page is Resurrected Gavi Outreach Ministry as well. We also have a YouTube page where persons can also connect with us. Say that one more time. <laughs> so our I don't the contact miss it. number for the ministry yeah. it's 876-440-6019 our email address is resurrectedgministries at gmail.com our Facebook handle is Resurrected Garvey Outreach Ministry. And our Instagram page is also Resurrected Garvey Outreach Ministries. And those are some of the ways that persons can connect with us and also reach out to us. And people can invite you to their churches and their seminars and their conferences to talk, right? Most definitely. One of the things that we do as well as speaking engagements and also we offer coaching services. Bless God. Woman of God hero unsung hero servant of god's people you shall be blessed i pronounce it over your life i Amen. declare it in the mighty name of jesus resources Amen. from all over doors will be open and doors doors will be shut because some of them just need to shut because there are hindrance to the flow and doors will be open because god wants it to be perfectly aligned to him and nobody else will get any glory Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Amen. even people who are around you that are not a good fit shall be removed now in Jesus' mighty name. I speak it in the prophetic because God has other people who are going to come who have the right spirit and the right agenda to work with you. They don't want fame. They don't want anything else but just the glory of God to be displayed. Sister, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. You're on the bridge. Thank you guys for tuning in today. It was an awesome show. Um, see us come check us out next week same same bad channel same bad time one o'clock on the bridge yeah take care it's pastor junior tucker saying i'll see you soon god bless you bye-bye